Hello, and welcome to episode four of Let's Translate Light Novels. We are going to be looking at the light novel Seiran Den. It is a Shikiyugi prequel, and I'm going to be critiquing the translations of three of my patrons. Now, if you want to join this group of patrons who have their translations of this light novel critiqued in these videos, you can join my $12 tier on Patreon, and I will send you the materials for this about a month in advance, and you'll have an opportunity to translate it for these videos. At this point, I would like to thank uh, my patrons for sponsoring this and all of my other videos on my other channels. You see their names on the screen right now. And I'd especially like to thank Greg, Henry Roaming, Lay, Charpixie, and Data Fox. And before we get on to this episode, first some quick disclaimers. The objective of this series is not to walk away with a finished translation of this novel. In actual fact, we're probably only going to get through the first several pages. The purpose of this series is to teach Japanese grammar and vocabulary. Additionally, the series objective is to show how you can take your understanding of Japanese and turn it into a proper translation. To demonstrate this, I'll be comparing and contrasting translations of this novel that I did in the year 2000, when I was at the intermediate level and completely new to translating, with translations from some of my patrons, as well as my insights today as a professional translator with over 15 years' experience. I do not own the rights to Seiran Den, and I did not get permission from the author, Nishizaki Megumi, to translate it. So again, I would like to emphasize that the intention of this video series is not to produce a translation of this book, but to teach Japanese and to show how translation can be done. I won't be naming my patrons who have contributed their translations in these videos, but I will credit them in the video description if they wish. And now, on to the video. Alright, so, moving on. The Japanese for this next part is Ayuru no naka ni ima wa hakkiri to ano aojiroku moeru bukimi na hitomi ga yomigaetta. Next sentence. Karada wo tsuranuku yona hageshi okan wo so sentence number one, ayuru no naka ni ima wa So hakkirito is very clearly. So inside of ayuru, now, clearly, aujiroku uh, is like pale, pale white. Moeru, uh, so burning pale whitedly, <laughs> it's turning aujiroi into an adverb, aujiroku. Bukimi na hitomi, so the things that are burning palely in an eerie way are these bukimina, these eerie, creepy, hitomi, eyes, ga yomigaeta. So this verb that comes at the end is actually going to come towards the beginning of the sentence because that's how Japanese works. Yomigaeru is to, to kind of like come back to you, um, to relive something, to have a flashback. Uh, it's kind of like to have a flashback. It's, it's a little beyond to remember something. It's more like to experience it again, to come back to you. So now clearly inside of Ayuru, um, memories of, or he relived the experience of, um, seeing, you know, those creepy pale eyes uh, burning. So that's kind of what that means, <laughs> basically. So that's the first sentence. Second sentence, karada wo tsuranuku yona hageshi okam. So uh, okam is, if you look at the kanji, it means evil and cold. So that's like literally what it means, an evil coldness, an evil. Hageshi is like intense or violent, and then karada wo tsuranuku is to pierce through the body. So yona, so a, as if it is piercing through the body, this intense, evil chilling. Um, kare wa ha o kuishibatte, so ha o kuishibaru is to like grit your teeth, uh, clench your teeth, clench your jaw. Uh, taeru is to endure something or to bear something, so he, he grit his teeth, he clenched his jaw, he clenched his teeth and, and bared um, as he felt the uh, intense, violent, uh, evil coldness uh, that felt like it was piercing his body. That's like a very literal interpretation of what all of that means. So patron A translated those two sentences as, those pale, ominous eyes came back to Ayuru clearly, period. He clenched his teeth and endured the chills piercing through his body. So this is pretty straightforward. Note how some of the like order in, of the of these words has been rearranged in the sentence. Uh, Hakkirito moved from the beginning, middle of the sentence to the end, came back to Ayuru clearly. Um, those pale, ominous eyes uh, moved from the middle of the sentence to the beginning. So, you know, that's good. That's what you have to do when you translate Japanese. You would not want to keep the word order the same. Um, pale, ominous, I, I really like the use of ominous for bukimina. Uh, came back to Ayuru clearly. Uh, yeah, came back to, come back to is a, it's a simple, straightforward way of um, translating yomigairu. I, I personally like relive or re-experience uh, or like re-traumatize in some instances. He clenched his teeth. I like the clench verb. I think it sounds more 
it makes you fear, feel it more viscerally than he grit his teeth and endured the chills piercing through the body. So uh, this patron chose to change the karada uh, o tsuranuku yona uh, as if it is piercing the body, decided to make the metaphor more explicit, like the chills piercing through his body, not the the feeling of chills piercing through his body. And I think this is a good choice because um, in Japanese, they're a little more like yona, yona, yona with their metaphors. But in English, we're not always saying as if, as if, or like a, like a with our metaphors. Sometimes we're a, a little more literal with our metaphors and we just say there are chills piercing through his body, even though there really aren't. <laughs> it's a figurative statement here. All right, so patron B's translation. Ayuru thought back to Tenko's uncannily glowing vivid pale pupils. I don't know about uncannily personally for me. Uh, to me, when I think of uncanny, I think of, ooh, that was an uncanny smart thing for you to do or whatever. I don't know, for me personally, it doesn't do the trick, uh, but that's just me. Uh, vivid pale pupils is also an interesting choice. Um, I think the hakirito is where this vivid comes from. I think vivid is a good word choice for hakiri, but vivid pale is is an odd uh, turn of phrase for that. And it's not necessarily that the the pale eyes were vividly pale. It's rather that uh, this entire scene is is vividly coming back to Ayuru. Ayuru thought back to Tenko. So yomigaeta is in this case thought back instead of it came back. I personally prefer, it, it, it's, it's like this is happening to him. It's like he's experiencing a flashback. So Ayuru thought back gives Ayuru a little more agency here and he doesn't have that. So I don't think um, Ayuru thought back to was a really good choice here uh, for Yomi Gaeta um, because Yomi Gaeta is, it's something that happens to you. It's not something that you choose. I'm gonna choose now to have a flashback <laughs> to the time. That's kind of how it comes across when you're reading it in English. I like glowing. Uh, vivid uh, again the vivid I would have moved that somewhere else glowing pale pupils is fine I think uh, combining glowing and pale together into one word I like like ominous uh, in the last one I kind of liked that yeah and I like also that patron B um, I personally like I don't know if this was a good choice but I personally like that patron B um, gave the owner of the eyes a name here and said Tenko's glowing uh, vivid pale pupils uh, because th these are Tenko's eyes that we're talking about Despite their cold, piercing gaze, he gritted his teeth and withstood the pain. So again, this gritted, um, I feel personally like clenched, just kind of gives you a more like, <laughs> that sort of image. Grit his teeth is more like, <clears throat> my mom is making fun of me right now, but I'm just gonna grit my teeth and bear it versus clenched is more like, ah, it's hurting me <laughs> physically, but it's not wrong. Um, despite their cold piercing gaze. So it's more like he's, gr he's clenching his teeth and enduring the pain of that intense sensation of the eyes. Um, and he's recalling something that happened to him in the past. So despite their cold piercing gaze, he grit his teeth. I wouldn't have done a despite here. And it, it wasn't present in the Japanese either. It's more just he, he clenched his jaw and, and withstood, endured um, the pain, uh, the, the chilling evil. Um, of the intense thing, the sensation that was piercing his body. It wasn't really a despite. It sounds more like, like a calm narration. Despite their cold, piercing gaze, he gritted his teeth and withstood the pain rather than like, um, he clenched his teeth and endured the chills piercing through his body. So this is where it can kind of help um, when you write your English translation, even though this is technically pretty correct, right? It, it doesn't sound, it doesn't, give you that visceral reaction. So if you read your translation out loud after you translated it, if you can like, and use your best like eerie narrator sort of voice to kind of bring about the tone that you're going for, uh, if it doesn't quite sound right when you say it in that tone, then you might want to reword it a little bit and rework it. Patron three, I might regret doing all three patrons in this video because it might wind up being really long, like even longer than the other videos, but we'll see. Patron three, <laughs> this is a patron who has not yet contributed. So this is cool. I like more, more perspectives. Those eerie eyes burning blue white came back to him. I like that. So this is three sentences instead of two, which you can definitely do when you translate light novels. You don't have to like keep every sentence in its own thing, like it was in Japanese. So eerie for Bukimi, I would assume. So you got ominous from patron A, uncannily, I would say, wow, my neighbors are so loud. Can you please stop stomping on my ceiling? Uh, I hope you can't hear that. 
um, and Eerie for Patron 3. Three different translations of Bukimina. I like Ominous, personally. It has this more like, ooh, <laughs> sort of feel to it. Eerie, Eerie's kind of cool, too. Uh, eerie Eyes, Burning Blue White, Came Back to Him. I kind of like that. Those eerie eyes, burning blue-white, came back to him. He could see them so clearly. So this hakkirito yumigaeta, um, the hakkirito was moved to its own second sentence. And I kind of like that. It gives, it gives the narration a bit of a rhythm to it. Those eerie eyes, burning blue-white, came back to them. He could see them so clearly. He clenched his teeth through the violent chill that pierced through his body. I liked it. Yeah, I like the use of clenched from patrons A and C. The violent chill. So, hageshi, translating that as violent, is sometimes a rookie mistake. Um, it often is, isn't violent, it's more like intense. In this case, violent isn't so bad. Violent chill because Tenko is evil <laughs> and it does hurt him. So I think violent is okay. But yeah, I like that Patron C did it into three different sentences. The next line. So in parentheses, this denotes that a character is thinking something. Nadze! And then six dots, question mark, exclamation point. Patron A translated that as, but why? Patron B translated that as simply, why? Three question marks in italics. And patron C translated that as, but why? Three dots, question mark, and italics. And then goes on to add, um, this is not the, the end of the paragraph for patron C. There's a line or two of narration that come after this, and patron C has chosen to include that in the, in the but why. So I don't know about but why, personally. Um, I just think why for me personally. It's not wrong, but I, I would just say why. So the, le the next line that comes after that is actually like a very long sentence, <laughs> and it finishes and it further expands upon this nadze. So ayuru wa nandomo nandomo jimon shita. So jimon suru, if you look at the kanji, uh, the first kanji is the kanji that you'll see in jibun, like oneself, and then mon is the kanji you'd see in tou or toikakeru, like to ask. So, to ask oneself, basically. Nandomo, uh, nandomo, over and over again, Ayuru asked himself, Itsumo jibun dachi ichizoku wo mamotte kudasatte iru to, osanai koro kara kikasarete ita tenkou sama ga naze. So that they're repeating this naze again here. So, naze, dot dot dot, and then, so it's like, why? was Tenko, this god that I've been told since I was a little boy would protect me and my tribe. Uh, why was he so creepy <laughs> is basically what this whole Naze section is. That's why I kind of don't think but why works necessarily. But why is more like when somebody is telling you something, like Tenko is a good god, and then you're like, but why? He looks so evil. Um, but he's just kind of asking himself. Dunno, could just be a personal thing. So patron A, Ayudu asked himself over and over, and then patron A added quotes to this part, even though there were none in Japanese. I was always told that Lord Tenko protected our clan. Why is he dot 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 question mark? So it's not entirely a bad choice to put this in quotes, except that he's not saying this out loud. His mother is there. Like if he were alone, it wouldn't be so bad to have quotes around this, but his mother is there. So if you put quotes, it, it implies that he's saying it out loud and his mother is hearing him say this, but he's not. He's thinking it. And yeah, this was actually a good call noticing and recognizing that this is what he's thinking. So patron A could have put the but why um, in italics instead of in quotes. And then I was always told that Lord Tenko protected our clan. Why is he? I could have put that in italics. So why is he dot dot dot? That's that's a bit stilted in Japanese. That's not the, really the way we would write things in English. It'd just be like, why? <laughs> and like, you would ask the rest of the question, but you're too scared to ask it. Ayuru asked himself over and over is pretty straightforward. I was always told, um, osanai koro kara, from, a, from an early age, from a young age, um, but patron A left that part out, and that's perfectly acceptable. You can do that. Um, usually, like, if this were an anime translation or a game translation or a manga translation, you'd be a lot more likely to leave out things like that that can get a little overly wordy in English, but with novel translation, you actually can leave things like that in if you think that it would serve the translation better. And I think I was always told from a young age, I think adding the from a young age, like ever since I was born, I was I was told over and over again, like I was told that this is a good God and he's, he's protecting us. I think that adds a little more emphasis to it. Um, and it 
it further justifies Ayuru's like crisis, his existential crisis that he's having right now. So I would have kept in Osanai Korokara since I was little, or since I was young, or since I was a kid, since I was a baby. Um, but yeah, the, the translation here was tightened up quite a bit, which is always nice, but not necessary. <laughs> All right, so patron B. Uh, Ayuru asked himself time and time again, I don't think time and time again works so well for nandomo nandomo in this context, and here's why. Time and time again implies like that it's something that he has asked himself like throughout the years, over the years of his life, but he's asking himself this now, like over and over again, like in the moment as he's reliving this um, experience that he had at the summoning ceremony with his tribe. So I don't think time and time again really works here, even though it technically means nandomo nandomo. Uh, Tenko, who had always protected them, whom he had heard about from his youngest days, why was he suddenly enraged? So this is keeping a little bit in the uh, word order of the Japanese. Tenko, who had always protected them, um, whom he had heard about from his youngest days, why was he suddenly enraged? So patron B did extrapolate um, from incomplete data here, naze dot dot dot, why was he suddenly enraged? <laughs> and um, that's okay, because uh, that is kind of what he's thinking, although it is a little bit too assuming um, that that is what Ayuru is thinking when we don't really know. I think why is just fine. Um, so why? Um, so yeah, Tenko, who had always protected them, who ha he had heard about from his youngest days, it's, it's a little bit unnatural sounding. I think this is a simply a matter of you'd have to like say it out loud a few times and then maybe remove some of these words. Uh, Tenko, the god who had always protected them. Now, whom he has heard about from his youngest days, this um, osanai koro karakika sarete ita, what he heard, uh, what he was told from his earliest days, osanai koro kara, was that itsumo jibun tachi chizoku wa mamotte kurasatte iru to. This to, this particle to is saying, like, this is the thing that he was told um, since he was a little boy. So, uh, yeah, you could rework those two sentences, who, who had always protected them, who he had heard. It's more who he had heard since he was a little child would always protect them. It's more, th these thoughts go together more. So, yeah, that needs a little more workshopping. Patron C. But why, in italics, <laughs> Ayudu asked himself again and again, yep. Uh, he'd been told from a young age that Lord Tenko was always protecting their clan. So why did he do oh, so why dot 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 did he do it? So again, yeah, you don't need the did he do it, just so why? Also, Tenko didn't really do anything per se, except like look creepy to Ayuru. I think why? I think he's just trying to process everything and he's really confused. But yeah, I like that patron C like kind of cleaned up this whole um, kikasareta thing, moved it to the beginning. He'd been told from a young age that Lord Tenko was always protecting their clan. So why did he do it? But again, this, this patron C decided to go with a more narrative sort of thing. And then Nadze, just that one line, um, they expanded it into, so why did he do it? I think, um, I, I like what patron A did and kind of turned the whole thing um, after Ayuru wa nandomo nandomo jimon shita, turn that into Ayuru's thoughts, because that is, this is kind of what Ayuru is thinking. It's a tough call, because it's not really in parentheses, and you'll find that Japanese uh, punctuation is not always that clear, and it's not always like one-to-one -one the way it is in English. All right, the next lines. Sono tomadoi ni kare wa ochitsuki naku, shisen wo sama yowaseta. Uh, sono tomadoi, so tomadoi is like a hesitation, that hesitation, his hesitation. Kare wa ochitsuki naku. Ochitsuki naku, uh, ochitsuku is to like to calm down. Ochitsuki naku is like uh, uncalming downingly, <laughs> without calming down. Shisen wo samayowaseru. So uh, samayowu is to wander. Samayowaseru is causative to make wander. So he uh, made his eyes wander around, um, not able to calm down um, because of uh, the confusion and hesitation that he was feeling. Uh, naze nara, um, and the reason why, if you want to know why, this is why. Shounen ga hajimete mita tenko no sono hitomi ni kanjita no wa, first part of the sentence, <laughs> ima made ajiwatta koto no nai hodo no gyoretsu na zouaku datta karada. All right, so long sentence. 
So not the nada. If you want to know why, here's why. <laughs> for it was because shonen ga hajimete mita, the boy saw for the first time tenko no sono hitomi ni kanjita no wa. So what he felt, what he sensed um, when he saw uh, Tenko's eyes for the first time, what he sensed in those eyes of Tenko's that he saw for the first time. Imamade ajiwatta koto no nai hodo no. So imamade ajiwatta koto no nai. Um, something that he has not tasted uh, up until now. Hodo no. So gyoretsu na zouaku. So zouaku, again, look at the kanji. Zo is hatred and Aku is evil. I've made a huge mistake. So yeah, hi, this is future Sarah editing this video right after I filmed it. And um, I should have really fact checked this like while I was recording the video, uh, but I didn't. So I made this mistake and I'm leaving it in because it's actually a really good mistake that we can all learn from. So the mistake that I made is I looked at those two kanji and I mistook the first one for um, Zo, it's actually pronounced the same way sometimes um, for its onyomi, but I reckon I mistook it for the kanji um, in nikushimi or nikumu to hate. And if you look at these two kanji, the one that it actually is means to increase or to multiply, but the one hatred um, has a different radical and it's a little bit different, you'll see. Uh, I really need to update my glasses prescription, <laughs> but even, even if I'd had an updated prescription, it's a pretty honest mistake, a pretty easy one to make because it looks very similar to zo, which means hatred. It's like the second kanji is the same. So it was an honest mistake. But yeah, um, it's one of those things where if you're a translator, uh, you need to second guess yourself all the time. Even if you think you know something or even if you know something, you should just be kind of looking up everything anyway, because you don't know what you don't know. And I didn't know that I didn't know this <laughs> in the moment when I was recording this video. And it wasn't until post right now when I was editing it that I thought, wait a minute, I better double check this. This doesn't really seem right. And I'm glad I did double check it. Otherwise, it would have been pretty embarrassing to put that on the internet. <laughs> so anyway, it means like an increasing sickness is kind of what this means. If you look at the Japanese definition there, it's like to get worse, um, particularly when you're sick. Yeah, it's a strange wording. So it's, um, it's, it's an intense like quickening sickness, the likes of which he's never experienced before, the likes of which he's never tasted before. Looking back on that now, um, I would probably have gone with something along with like translating this zoaku um, increasing sickness. We don't really have a word for that in English that I can really think of. There isn't really a good translation offered on um, dictionaries either. Um, so, you know, pain <laughs> you could go with. Uh, but yeah, it is not hatred. That That is definitely what it is not. Um, it's more like a bad feeling or a sickness. Intense hatred and intense evil. So an intense evil, the likes of which, hodo no, uh, he has never tasted before. And this ajiwatta, ajiwau, taste, uh, we don't always use that verb the same way in English. It kind of sounds poetic to phrase it that way, like a, a, an intense evil, the likes of which he has never tasted before. Uh, but yeah, it's more like felt, sensed, experienced um, in this context. Datta kara da. So it was because he uh, tasted, <laughs> he got a taste of um, an intense evil, the likes of which uh, he has never felt before the first time he looked into Tenko's eyes. So again, when you're kind of parsing it out and translating it in your brain, you kind of usually just want to flip everything in the sentence backwards. So patron A translated those two sentences as, he let his line of sight wander around in confusion. So sama yo waseru, this causative waseru uh, ending to verbs, you can think of it as let, uh, let a verb happen uh, versus make a verb happen. He let his line of sight wander around in confusion. Sounds a little weird <laughs> to let something wander around in confusion. I would say his eyes wandered around in confusion. Uh, you don't always have to uh, keep the case of the verb the same. Like if it's causative in Japanese, it doesn't always have to be causative in English. Uh, because what the boy felt when he first saw Tenko's eyes was the most intense evil he had ever experienced. Yeah, that's that's not wrong. It checks out. It's sort of like he he sensed that in Tenko's eyes. That's kind of like, So it might be better to rephrase that in such a way that shows like he, he felt the pain like. Uh, 
uh, not the pain, he felt the intense evil like in those eyes, from those eyes, rather than like he saw the eyes and then he felt like a bunch of evil. Uh, patron B, in his bewilderment, without him even noticing, his gaze had wandered. So again, this without him even noticing part was not in Japanese. And you kind of don't even need it uh, with this wording. In his bewilderment, his gaze had wandered. Yeah, neither of pa neither patron A or B so far kept in the kare wa uchitsuki naku, like nervously. I'd say like his, his eyes nervously darted to be fro in bewilderment would sort of be a more clean way of phrasing everything while keeping everything intact. It's not like his gaze had wandered, like he was just kind of like, oh, and then his gaze just kind of wandered without him noticing. It's more like he can't calm down and he's like, what is going on? It's kind of more like that versus he let his gaze, he, like, without him noticing his gaze had wandered, it's more like, I'm wondering about this and uh, my gaze wandered over there without me noticing. Uh, it's kind of the wrong feeling there. Again, it makes sense to kind of understand it in Japanese and try to really picture the scene in your brain before you uh, translate it. It was because the first time he saw Tenko's eyes, there was a boundless evil, I like boundless, uh, for ajiwatta koto no nai. It's, it's a bit of a stretch. Um, hate shinai would be more like boundless, like unending or whatever. Um, ajiwatta koto no nai is like he'd never encountered it before, which comes later. So there was a boundless evil. Oh, gyoretsu na, boundless, gotcha. Okay, yeah, gyoretsu na. It's more like intense. Uh, but boundless isn't entirely a, too much of a stretch. Evil energy, so zoaku is evil energy in this case, instead of just evil. I think just evil is fine. No, it's not! Um, unlike anything he had ever encountered before. I like that unlike anything he had ever encountered before for ajiwatta koto no nai, ima ma de ajiwatta koto no nai. I think that's a good turn of phrase there. So I like, I like some things here. Patron C, his confusion kept his gaze from settling in any one place. This is a little more literal, like what the Japanese was saying. Again, patron C did not keep the ochitsuki naku part of the sentence in here, which is interesting. None of the patrons kept that part in there. Yeah, this one kind of gives me more of an opinion of his confusion, like, huh? Hmm, I'm confused. My gaze is not settling in any one place. <laughs> it's more like, it's more like this. <laughs> <laughs> so his confusion kept his gaze. I don't know about confusion here. Bewilderment, I think, from patron B is a little more um, what this feeling is. I like that kept his gaze from settling in, in any one place, though, for samayo uh, waseta, like made to wander. That's another way of wording. Like if, if his gaze is wandering, then yeah, it's not going to settle in one place because he's so bewildered <laughs> or confused. He'd never known such intense aggravation as what he saw in the Lord's eyes. So patron C left out the whole um, da, da, kara, da at the end of the sentence. That was because uh, the reason why his eyes are wandering around in bewilderment or confusion was because he'd never known. And that's okay too. Um, you don't necessarily need like that was because, naze nara. Clearly sentence two is explaining sentence one in this case. Although perhaps you would want to leave that in just because the Japanese had it twice. They had naze nara, da bida 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 da takara da. So that was because he'd never known, or, you know, some other way of phrasing that was because he'd never known such intense aggravation. I don't know about aggravation here uh, as what he saw in the Lord's eyes. I like in the Lord's eyes, uh, just really clarifying that this intense evil is in their Lord's eyes. So like, why? Why is there all this intense evil in their Lord's eyes? Like I've been told since I was a baby that this is our God and that he protects us. So why, when we were summoning him, did I see in his glowing eyes this intense evil I've never felt before and then I fainted for two days? <laughs> That's a good question. Make you reconsider your religion. All right, you just might be in a cult, Ayuru. God, this video is gonna be so long. Tezukuri no yori o musaboru yo ni kuchi ni hakobu musuko no yosu o matuta wa manzoku so ni me o hisomete mitsumete ita. So tezukuri no yori, a uh, homemade, handmade cooking. Musaboru is like to really scarf it down. Yoni, so here's this yoni again, as if to scarf down, just scarfing down. Uh, kuchi ni hakobu, so this is another sort of idiom, carrying to his mouth. We don't say that in English, we just say eat, right? Uh, musuko no yosuo, so um, the appearance of her son, you know, devouring her handmade food. Matuta wa uh, 
uh, Matuta, his mom, Manzuk Soni, um, in satisfaction, Meo Hisomete Mitsumete Ita. So Meo Hisomeru um, is kind of another idiom. It, if, if you, if you kind of narrow your eyes, Meo Hisomeru, it usually means you smile. It means like you kind of smile softly or quietly or fondly. That's kind of what that means. Um, there's an implied smile in there, like looking fondly on someone. So Matuta looked fondly on her son as, she, as he scarfed down her handmade food. This is sort of like the literal translation of that. Patron A translated that as, Matuta looked on in satisfaction at her son who was devouring her homemade cooking. So it's missing the meo hisomete, um, which again, it has that sort of, you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you looked it up in a monolingual dictionary, but yeah, it usually means to like, to, to look fondly, to kind of smile. It's like, oh, bless him. <laughs> um, devouring, I like that for musaboru, her homemade cooking. Um, you don't necessarily need homemade cooking. Like, tezukuri no is, like, often an adjective used in Japanese that we don't necessarily need in English. It's kind of complied. If we just say her cooking, we know that she made it um, homemade. So if the homemade is a little uh, redundant here. Uh, patron B, maturu, matuta, <laughs> looking satisfied with her homemade meal completed for him to chow down on like a gluttonous little child, she announced. Okay, so this is a little bit fragmented here. Um, the she announced is leading into the next um, sentence, which is a line of dialogue from her. So she announced is not really wrong, even though it was not in the original Japanese. Um, but yeah, it's missing. Um, uh, Ayudu is eating. He is devouring. Um, she's not looking satisfied with her homemade meal completed for him to chow down on like a gluttonous little child. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a metaphor. It was like he actually is uh, devouring it like a gluttonous little child. Um, and it's also missing that meo uh, hisomete. <laughs> He's like, oh, sweet little boy. Uh, patron C, very short. Patron C really shortened this. Let's see. Matuta watched adoringly as her son scarfed down the food she prepared. This is actually kind of the most correct <laughs> translation of the three, although it is a very concisely cut down. This would be a great translation if this were a line of narration in an anime or a manga, because you want to keep it as tight as possible. Um, I don't really think it's missing much of anything. You watched adoringly, meo hisomete mitsumete ita. She watched adoringly as her son scarfed down, musabori yoni, the food she prepared. So tezukuri no yori, the food she prepared. It doesn't have to be like the homemade food or the homemade, the handmade cooking. Yeah, and this whole kuchi ni hakobu part, he, it, it's, he's scarfing it down. We don't really say in English he carried it to his mouth. So patron C, good job there. That's nice and concise. Uh, now the line of dialogue that patron B said she announced. Um, the line of dialogue. Sa, motto taksan o agari nasai. Zutto nemutta mama datta nda mono. Six dots. Eyo o tsukenakereba ne. All right, so sa, it's like, come now. Motto taksan, more. O agari nasai. That means like to, to, to consume, to eat. Like, please go ahead, eat, eat your fill, eat more. Zutto uh, nemutta mama. So nemutta mama uh, remained asleep. You were, you, you had remained asleep forever, zutto, uh, datta nda mono. So this nda mono at the end is this very like emphatic, like, come on, you got to eat because dude, you've, you've been out for two whole days, man. That's why you definitely have to eat more, eat more, more. <laughs> All right. That's what this nda mono does. Makes it very emphatic. Also makes it feminine because it's damon, damono. Uh, eio wo tsukenakereba ne. Eio is uh, nutrition, nutrients. Uh, tsukenakereba. So eio wo tsukeru mi, it's a phrase uh, like to, you need your nutrients. <laughs> you need your, your, your strength back. It's kind of what we'd say in English. Like you need to get your strength back. Um, so patron A, come eat more food. Since you've been asleep all this time, you must replenish your strength. This is a little like, Come, my son, you must replenish your strength. Uh, this character is not like this. She's a little more girly, a little younger than that. So it needs a little reworking with just character voice here. Uh, the translation is not wrong. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't really sound like Matuta. It doesn't really sound like a young mother. Uh, patron B. Well then, uh, Sa, I'd say you had better eat something now. So remember, patron B thought that. Uh, he wasn't eating yet. Like, she was smiling in satisfaction at the feast that she was going to feed him. Um, so that's why it's well, I'd say you had better eat something now. The boy is eating. She's like, 
Uh, please eat more, eat more. Since you've been sleeping so long, go on now, period. You need your nutrition, you know. Again, this is a little more like textbooky. It doesn't sound like a, a sweet mother, like a young mother. Like, come on, sweetie, eat up. You've been asleep. Come on. You gotta get you gotta get your nutrients. You gotta get healthier. You gotta bulk yourself up. Because you wanna sleep all that time, you know, kind of get yourself in her head and like, if you were a young mother, <laughs> how would you talk to your poor son who has been out for two whole days? Um, patron C, that's right, she said, eat up, you need nourishment after being asleep for so long. Yeah, this, this again is just a little more, you need nourishment after being asleep for so long. Yeah, again, there's, there's not as much, uh, like, feeling to this, and it's kind of hard to explain. Um, but again, like, think of character voice here and, um, her motivation. She was really worried, she loves her son, he was out for two days. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's right for Sa. You got come, well then, and that's right. And this illustrates how Sa can be translated so many different ways. Um, sa is like something you say when you're prompting someone like, Sa, Sa, like, come on, come on, eat up, eat up. Um, so none of these are really wrong. Well then, that's right, come, um, she said. I like the adding in the she said, even though that wasn't there in the original Japanese because it clarifies that this is her talking. Eat up, I like eat up. You need nourishment after being asleep for so long. Yeah, I mean, this is fine too. I think it's, again, very clean and concise. Short sentence, woohoo. Shounen wa hashi no te o tometa. So hashi no te o tomeru is another sort of like idiom. It's like a set, not really an idiom, but it's just a set phrase. Um, it literally means like to stop the hand, uh, to, to stop your chopstick hand, basically, is what that literally means. It, be, it means like you pause mid bite, like, you kind of freeze, chopsticks in hand, you stop eating, that's kind of what it means. So patron A, the boy put down his chopsticks, that works. Patron B, he stopped with his chopsticks dead in his tracks. It doesn't, it's not wrong, but it's a little overly wordy. Dead in his tracks, uh, it's more like the chopsticks were dead in their tracks, and then that's also just a weird way of uh, wording that. I think patron B was tripped up with the verb tometa, like to stop. And yeah, in this case, you don't really want to translate that as stop. The boy stopped his chopsticks. <laughs> like, stopped them from doing what? <laughs> from moving, which also sounds weird. So the boy put down his chopsticks. The boy stopped eating, if you wanted to say stopped. Um, patron C, the boy paused mid-bite. That works too. Um, yeah, it's like, hashi no te o tomeru. It's like, you're eating, you're eating, you're eating. <laughs> That's kind of what it is. It's not necessarily like, you're eating, you're eating, you're eating. I put down my chopsticks, <laughs> but it's more like, huh? It's like you stop mid-bite, you pause. I just think pause mid-bite paints a more accurate picture of what's happening. Because the next line that he says there, Kasama, sonna jitto mirareru to komatte shimau yo. So like he's eating and then he stops. Kind of mid-bite like, mom, don't stare at me like that. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> That's like what he's saying there. So yeah, jitto mirareru, uh, to be stared at intensely is what that means. Komatte shimau. Komaru is one of these, I hate that verb. I'm going to have to do a Tricky Translations and False Friends episode <laughs> about komaru because that's a really hard verb to translate. Um, yeah, in this case, it kind of means you're embarrassing me. It doesn't mean like, it literally means like to be in trouble or to be troubled to be problematic or whatever, but in this case it really means like, you're embarrassing me, mom. Patron A translated that as, mother, I get bothered when you stare at me like that. So, you know, since this story is high fantasy and it does take place like super in the past, um, wording like that isn't entirely incorrect here. Mother for Kasama makes perfect sense. It's a very noble regal way of addressing your mother. Um, I get bothered when you stare at me like that. Yeah, it's more like he's he's calling her out right now in the moment for staring at him like that. Not like, when whenever you stare at me like that, I get bothered. But rather, don't stare at me like that. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> um, patron B. Mom, please don't stare at me while I'm trying to eat. It's making me uncomfortable. That works. Um, uncomfortable is a really good translation of komaru. Uncomfortable, embarrassed, awkward. Yeah, I like that one. This well I try to eat uh, is more implied. Uh, you recall it was not in the original Japanese. Like, that would be like, don't stare at me while I'm trying to eat. Um, but it's, it's not wrong to add that in there because that's, that's kind of what he's saying. It's like, hey, I'm trying to eat, mom. You're embarrassing me. Don't stare at me like that. Uh, patron C, mother, I can't eat with you staring at me like that. That works too. So we did a lot of this in past videos in this series. Wagako is like my child, one's child, but it's her child. Uh, nimukatte, 
Um, we did this in previous ones too, so to turn to face. <laughs> uh, but she's already looking at him, so she's not like turning and facing. It, it's more just like um, ho ho enda. She performed the action of smiling at him, basically, is this waga koni mukatte. She smiled at her son who was about to turn 10. Uh, the mother smiled at her 10 year old child, is patron A. So, kind of mild spoiler, but not really. Um, he's actually 10 today. It is his 10th birthday today. Um, yeah, just sainaru, that phrase is usually like 10 years old this year sort of thing. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that he actually is 10, um, but you do find out like a couple pages later that it is his 10, it is his birthday today. He's turned 10. <laughs> so that's not incorrect actually to say smile that her 10 year old child. In fact, that is a lot cleaner than saying smile at her son that would be turning 10 this year. Uh, patron B, she turned away, nope, <laughs> she turned towards him and smiled thinking of her now 10 year old son. I like the now 10 year old because yeah, uh, just signing out is, it, it implies like he will be 10 soon or he just turned 10. And again, spoiler, he is turning 10 today. So now, now 10 year old son works pretty well there. Uh, but she did not turn away and smile thinking of her son. He, she smiled at him. Blah. Patron C. <laughs> I already regret doing three patrons, but that's okay. She smiled at the boy of 10 years. This is a little like robotic and not very personal. This is more like a fond emotional sort of moment. And it just sounds very like, she smiled at the boy of 10 years. <laughs> it's like very like textbooky narration. Yeah, and it's not the boy, uh, it's her son, Wagako. I mean, she smiled at her son of 10 years. I think that makes it like just the boy in this case makes it sounds very like distanced. So she smiled at her son of 10 years. That works too. Um, and then she says, this is in quotes, Ayuru, omae wa kirei na ko ne, maru de onna no ko no yo. All right, so omae wa, uh, again, she uses the omae pronoun, you, uh, for her son. Omae, a lot of people think that it means that it's like a rude way of saying you, but it's actually not. It's like omae can be rude, but only because it means that um, you are close with the person that you're calling omae, and it also means that you are above the person that you're calling omae. So frequently, like as, as a pet owner, my cat's like right there, I would po probably call her omae. <laughs> uh, I might call, I might call my husband omae. <laughs> you could do that. Uh, not as common, usually be anata, that's the cliche form of address there. But yeah, omae is not rude. Um, in this case, if the son called her omae, that would be rude because it's like, you're below me, mom. <laughs> um, but it's actually, it's a fond, endearing sort of way of addressing her son. Kirei na kone, you're a really pretty child, literally. You're so pretty. Maru um, de, it's almost as if, it's just like, onna no kono yo. It's almost as if you're like a girl. You look like a girl. Like, ah, you do, you're such a pretty boy. You're such a pretty child. Like, you look just like a little girl. <laughs> Patron A, you really are a beautiful boy, Ayuru. You look like a girl. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not quite as blunt as you look like a girl. <laughs> it's kind of what that sounds like. It's more like you're beautiful like a girl. Um, not, not necessarily you look like a girl, but like you're beautiful just like a girl. <laughs> or like you have the beauty of a girl kind of thing rather than you look like a girl. But I like you really are a beautiful boy, Ayuru. That really has that uh, emotionality in there, that fondness. Uh, patron B, Ayuru, dot, 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 you certainly are, you are certainly a beautiful child of wonder, aren't you? Almost like a daughter, even. Oh, I kind of like that, almost like a daughter, even. The beautiful child of wonder, again, patron B likes to add a lot of stuff. Sometimes it does serve a purpose, like it extrapolates on, you know, the subtext of what is not being explicitly said in Japanese, but what is definitely being implied. But I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say like beautiful child of wonder, necessarily works that well. It's more just she's marveling over how pretty he is, really. Um, uh, you certainly are a beautiful child, aren't you? I think would work just fine. Uh, almost like a daughter, even. I kind of like the even in there. I think that kind of like, yeah, you, you could even pass as, a, as my daughter because you're so pretty. I kind of like that. Patron C, you're a beautiful child, Ayuru. Beautiful like a girl. Yeah, this encapsulates it. It's not like you look like a girl, but you're beautiful like a girl. And I like that patron C left out the maru de no yo business. It's like, it's almost as if you are like a girl. It's like, beautiful like a girl. Your beauty is, is like that of a girl's. Ayuru says, sonna, six dots, period. <laughs> Onna no ko nante hidoi ya, ka sama. So sonna is like, again, 
many different ways of translating that. It's basically something he's, he's like, I protest. It's like an interjection protesting something that somebody else said. That's what sonna is in this case. Sometimes it's, oh my god. Uh, in this case, though, it's like, sonna kato nai yo, or like, no way, what you just said is not true kind of thing. Uh, I protest. <laughs> um, don't say that. Onna no ko nante, like, a girl of all things, this nante, it's sort of like scoffing, like a girl. Hidoi ya, like, that's mean, like, how, that's cruel of you, mother, kasama. Patron A, it's really mean to call me a girl, mother. So again, she wasn't calling him a girl, she was saying, you're pretty like a girl. Um, so it's mean to say I'm like a girl, is kind of really what this is. And it's leaving out the sonna, <laughs> which is like, God, God, mom. If this were contemporary, I'd be like, Jesus, mom, <laughs> don't call me a girl. Don't, don't tell me I look like a girl, that's mean. Patron B, mom, don't compare me to a girl. Seriously, I like this seriously. Cause yeah, he's like, he's complaining like, mom, don't compare me to a girl. <laughs> seriously, I like that one. Patron C, no way, exclamation point. It's awful to be a girl mother. Wow, that's, that, that's a bold statement there. Um, and then Patron C added a, a dialogue tag to this, which I like. So we'll, we'll kind of revisit that when we look at the next couple lines of narration. Um, no way. Yeah, in this case, again, sonna, it can be, it can be translated as no way. In this case, though, because of the dot, 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 it's like sonna. It's like, oh my God, like, no. Like, how could you say that? That's kind of more what it's like here. It's not like an indignant, no way, it's awful to be a girl. And that's not what he's saying. It's like, how could you call me something like a girl, mother? Um, so, the, the son who looked a lot like his mom, so ikaisu is to like to retort, to say back. Um, muki ni natte, muki ni naru is to like get offended or to like lose one's temper a little bit, to get indignant, to get huffy, to get sassy. Um, and futto warau is like, <laughs> or like, <laughs> you know, it's just to kind of smile or snicker or laugh like, <laughs> like that. Um, so the son who looked a lot like his mother, like um, retorted indignantly and, and then she, she chuckled. Um, patron A, much like herself, the son got angry and talked back at her. So yeah, um, to, to be like Nita, uh, it can mean to, to be like a person, to resemble a person, but you, in this case, it definitely means physically resemble her. She, she was saying like, you look like a girl, like, and patron B even took that further and be like, you could even be my daughter. And the next line says he, he looked quite a bit like his mother and he got indignant and like, uh, scoffed back at her. So this much like herself part, uh, it, it's like he looked like her. The son, uh, again, this the son, the boy, well, the boy is fine, but the son is, is very strange, a very strange way of wording this. It's her son. Uh, got angry and talked back at her. So more like angrily talked back at her instead of got angry and talked back. Muki ni natte, like that phrasing, um, does sort of have a tendency to be translated as got angry or became angry, but it could just be angrily uh, talked back at her. And there's an airplane. The mother suddenly laughed. Yeah, again, even though it is like hutto, um, the mother suddenly laughed sounds kind of weird. It implies that like out of nowhere, like ha 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 ha, instead of just like as her son, like mom, and she's like. <laughs> Um, suddenly doesn't quite service it well here. Like the mother, I'd say like the mother, the mother laughed fondly or something. This futto is like, <laughs> you know. Patron B, as much as Ayuru took after his mother's appearance, he was somewhat taken aback by her statement. Interesting. She laughed coyly. Coyly, yes, that's what I was looking for. Bravo, Patron B. She laughed coyly is a, is a pretty good one for hahawa <laughs> futto at the like, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. She laughed coyly or like giggled also would be good. Um, this is not quite what this narration is. As much as Ayuru took after his mother's appearance, he was somewhat taken aback by her statement. Um, this is more like describing the way he said the last line, which segues into patron C here. No way, it's awful to be a girl mother. He retorted, irritated at his mother's teasing. 
So see how patron C did this, and this is smart. <laughs> this is something that you want to try to do when you translate a novel like this. Uh, Japanese prose does not work the same way English prose does. We will often, after somebody says a line of dialogue, have like a comma and then a description of how the person said that line of dialogue. So he retorted, irritated at his mother's teasing. Adding a little extra information that wasn't necessarily in the Japanese, irritated at his mother's teasing. Um, but yeah, I like that Patron C made this a dialogue tag. She burst into a giggle. He looked so much like her. So this haha ni yokunita musuko, it is a strange wording. Like the son, her son, who looked a lot like her, uh, got angry and retorted back at her. <laughs> it's a little weird in English. In Japanese, it works just fine. But in English, it actually was a pretty cool choice to move that whole haha ni yokunita musuko wa all the way over to the end in its own sentence. She burst into a giggle. He looks so much like her. Like, and that's why she's giggling. Because, like, she's like, you look like, a, you're pretty just like a girl. And he's like, how dare you say I'm pretty like a girl. And as he's saying this to her, he looks very pretty like a girl. And she, like, <laughs> giggles coyly uh, because he looks so much like her. Last line of dialogue. All right, this video might only be 45 minutes long instead of an hour. Woohoo. Demo, toki ga tateba, omae wa lirishi otoko ni seichou suru. So, dare yori mo tsuyoku, dare yori mo yasashi otoko ni. All right, so there's no way my patrons could possibly know this, but this line of dialogue winds up becoming extremely poignant. <laughs> it comes up much later in the novel in a very poignant way. Um, so, did my patrons know this, they probably would have put a lot more care into this. But I'm just letting you guys know this is meta here. We're never going to get to the point of the novel where this is really important. But yeah, just so you know, this is a very important line. Um, toki, a, toki ga tateba, uh, if time passes, once time passes, over time. Omae wa ririshi otoko ni seichou suru. Seichou suru is to grow, to mature. Uh, ririshi is like valiant, uh, very manly, um, chivalrous brave, <laughs> oh, dapper, not really dapper, dashing, courageous, otoko ni seicho suru. So uh, in time, you will grow up, you will mature into a, a dashing, strong man. It's like, even though I just said you're pretty like a girl, it's like, when you grow up, you're going to be, you're going to be a really dashing hot guy. And boy, was she right. <laughs> so that's right. Dare yori mo tsuyoku, stronger than anyone. Dare yori mo yasashi, uh, kinder, gentler than anyone. A man who is stronger and gentler than anyone. Um, so, patron A. But with the passage of time, toki ga tateba, you will grow into a dignified young man. Didishi, yeah. Didishi is just manly, <laughs> like chivalrous. Uh, like the opposite of toxic masculinity. It's like you're going to grow into like a really, really like the best version of a man <laughs> that a man can be. You're just like a great man. Yes, a man who's, I don't know about dignified in this case. We'll see what the other patrons translated Didi Shi as. Um, yes, a man who's stronger and kinder than anyone else. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. This is technically correct. Yes, comma. I, I, would, I would definitely keep the ellipses in in that case. I know I've been like, saying in all these videos before, ah, you should just take out as many ellipses as you possibly can. But when she's saying this line, she's being a bit reflective and, and she's kind of predicting the future here. Uh, we know this as readers of this light novel because we've seen the anime, <laughs> Shigi Yugi, where Nakago is a grown up. He's not a child in that one. So she's sort of like, yes, and like getting kind of dreamy, like, yes, so that's right. Dot, dot, dot. Dare yori mo tsuyoku, dare yori mo yasashi. Who's stronger and kinder. So note patron A didn't go, a man who's stronger than anyone else and a man who's kinder than anyone else. You don't have to repeat that whole than anyone else both times. So that's a smart one. You could keep it in there for poetry's sake if you worded it a certain way. But that's what patron A did. Patron B. However, as time goes by, I like that for toki ga tateba. As time goes by. That's very cliche but poetic. Um, you will grow. Uh, needs a comma after by. You will grow into a splendid young man. Splendid, for Didi Shi. Um, I'm sure of it. Ooh, I like that. For soul, I'm sure of it. Um, you'll be a man stronger than any other, more loving than any other. This is nice, actually. I like the translating yasashi as loving. That's not actually that much of a stretch. Um, if you're a kind person, you're a loving person generally. If you're a gentle person, you're a loving person. Not that much of a stretch. I like that. 
a man stronger than any other, more loving than any other. Again, I said you didn't have to repeat the than any other, but this is poetic. I think maybe somehow Patron B kind of caught on that this was a really poignant line. <laughs> I'm not sure putting words into Patron B's mouth, but yeah, this, the translation, the, 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 the wording of this line does sound a little more poetic. However, as time goes by, you will grow into a splendid young man. I'm sure of it. You'll be a man stronger than any other, more loving than any other. It just has a nice musicality to it. I like it. All right, patron C. But in time, toki ga tateba, you'll grow to be a gentleman. So patron C combined didi shi and otoko into just one word, gentleman. And that works. Again, like didi shi otoko is sort of like the best version of a man <laughs> that a man can be, the opposite of a toxic masculinity. Yes, dot, dot, dot. Stronger and kinder than all others. And I like this because it implies that he's, he's going to be like, a great man, um, stronger and kinder than all the others, all the other men. Um, I like the implication there. Um, because, dare yori mo tsuyoku, dare mo yasashi otoko ni. So you're gonna become a man who is stronger and kinder, more loving than the other men, is sort of the implication there. So I like how that kept that intact. So that's the end of episode four of Let's Translate Light Novels. Man, these are getting long. Hey, tune in about two weeks from now for episode five, and do check out my Patreon if you want to be a part of this. Bye bye <laughs>